Each week, nearly a dozen movies are released theatrically. 40 films a month, more than 400 a year. That's a plethora of cinema. Too much cinema. You'd have to be an addict to see all that. But don't fret. We've got you covered. This is Cinematics. Hey everyone, what's up? It's another week of Cinematics. This is episode number 229. We're covering movies for the week ending Friday, February 16th. Movies include Land of Bad, Monolith, and Lights Out. I'm joined by my betters, Bruce Perky and Eric Holmes. Eric, you've been doing a lot of interviews the last past week, sending me a bunch of interviews. I'm sure it's all a wash. What any highlights from the past week as far as interviews go? Uh yeah, we got uh we got a interesting documentary called The Hobby. Uh it should be out by the time you're hearing this. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And Air Force One down. Talked to the director of that and got some really cool, uh, uh, really cool background on like just uh, you know stunt people directing and you know actors doing stunt scenes versus uh, doing uh, stunt scenes with actors that can't really. I, you know, I used the uh, Scott Adkins versus uh, Liam Neeson kind of uh, setup, and he rolled with it and got some pretty cool stuff there. Okay, cool. So that's the hobby and Air Force One Down, which Eric will be covering on the recommend section. Again, our features are, it's going to be interesting because Lights Out, Eric and I reviewed that or actually saw that a couple of weeks ago. Let's see if we can actually summon our memories and thoughts on that movie. But then there's other movies called- Good luck. <laughs> yeah, good luck. No, I, I I actually do remember it pretty well. Land of Bad and Monolith. Bruce, from the stuff that we're covering, you're doing the Stanford Prison Experiment for your box movie was it a good week and fruitful week for you as far as movies go? Yeah, it was a good week. Uh, you know, quite a variety of different kinds of movies, which is always nice. Not a whole bunch of serious indie movies or a whole bunch of <laughs> action movies that you guys pick. So it's kind of a, a variety. And I, I had two other movies I didn't even put on the list. So, yeah. Very, very good. Okay, so let us start off with... Oh, wait, you know what? Patreon. I've been slacking off on this. Eric's pick for 1993 is this movie called, I think, Eight Immoral Stories or something, or The Untold Story. Yes. I just saw the poster of it today. Bruce, have you seen – I forgot. Did you see that movie way back in the day, or did were you able to see it? Yes, I saw it? this way back in the day, but it's, I think, similar to what, if I remember, Eric said is that my memory is fairly foggy on it, so it'll be like a new watch for me. All right. So, And my apologies, Patreon members. I was late in putting up. What movies other than – the untold stories. Do you want us the untold story you, that you want us to see and review? That second pick will be a Patreon member choice. I'm thinking movies from '93. I looked at some of them. True Romance might be a movie I'd, I'd want us to cover. That's a great movie, but we've already seen it. But it'd be nice to do a little bit of a rewatch. Thinking of Robert Altman's Shortcuts and The Sandlot, I believe, which I have never seen. So that these are some interesting picks that our Patreon members can hopefully pick for us and we will be doing that patreon episode at the end of this month of the end of february happy valentine's day to eric holmes and bruce perky thank you guys i know both of you have very busy love lives for this week on eric you're a romantic of a valentine's day person did you get the people you love something interesting no uh holidays tend to come and go very I don't even know they're here until someone says, uh, oh, by the way, it's Christmas. I'm like, oh, cool. That's very uplifting, Eric. I am on the same boat with you. What about you, Bruce? Before we get into the features, anything really special for the family, for the wife? Did you, Or is it just love that's inherent every day in the Berkey household? Uh, that is exactly true. The last thing you said. <laughs> but I did get chocolate because she loves chocolate. And we live very close to a Russell Stover store. And the great thing about that, and she doesn't care, uh, they have, so you'll go in there like now and there's a wall of Christmas chocolate that's very cheap. So I can get like piles of chocolate for very little money. Same thing like <laughs> two months after Easter and Mother's Day, they'll have the giant chocolate Easter bunnies for like $2 and I can go buy like five giant <laughs> chocolate Easter bunnies. And I apologize, Bruce. I, I'm pretty ignorant when it comes to Russell. You said it's Russell Stover. So even though it's late and you can get them at a bargain deal, these chocolates are just 
Primo good when you're eating the, that Easter bunny chocolate or Christmas chocolate run? Oh, yeah, it's, it's fine. It's just that you don't have a lot of ways to sell Easter bunnies in like July. <laughs> so, but I will buy them, no problem. <laughs> very, very cool. I hear that's a very nice purchasing tip from Bruce. You know, chocolate is chocolate. So no matter how shaped they're in, they always taste good. So save yourself a couple bucks and the intention is there. Speaking of intention, there's a movie called Land of Bad. It's directed by William Eubank. He is the director of Love. The Signal, there's a paranormal activity movie that he directed, which Eric Holmes, who interviewed William Eubank this week, he referenced. I don't know if either Bruce or Eric have seen that installment of paranormal activity. He also directed Underwater, a movie that I believe both Eric and Bruce really enjoyed. I still have yet to see Underwater. Now, Land of Bad is, I think, could be considered, might be a, considered a departure for filmmaker William Eubank. Stars... Liam Hemsworth, I believe he is a, yeah, he's a rookie officer who is, joins a Delta Force team to conduct some kind of mission in a remote part of the world, a jungle area. They drop down into this jungle and he is pretty much an outsider among the crew. They're nice to him. They're nice enough to him. The crew includes actors Luke Hemsworth, Ricky Whittle, and Milo Ventimiglia. These are the people who help accompany him. He basically accompanies them on this trip. And there's someone else. I don't, they don't have the actor's name here right now, but just a, a, a Delta Force unit plus the Liam Hemsworth character. The thing is they get ambushed and they are out in the jungle alone. The Liam Hemsworth character is separated from the group and he is on a mission to find a plane which will get him out of the jungle Russell Crowe is an Air Force drone pilot who is attempting to help these soldiers get out of this area within a 48-hour time period. Interesting, Land of Bad is essentially two stories for the price of one. There is the drone pilot story, which is its own thing in that military area, and there's some comedy. There, and it's not... Siri, it's not lighthearted because they're in a very tragic situation, but there is some comedic moments among the drone pilot and his assistant and the people within the area. There's a whole situation about a television and people are watching the NCAA, NC2A basketball championships. I think it's probably March Madness. There's a little bit of element to that. The actual element that drew me to Land of Bad was the story of that rookie officer, again, played by Liam Hemsworth. Is he able to survive within this 48-hour time period. Really enjoyed this movie. Thought it was a straight-ahead, solid action movie. Start off with you, Eric Holmes, your thoughts on Land of Bad. Yeah, I really like this one a lot, uh, especially um, I, I've compared it a lot to uh, The Lone Survivor and uh, the movie Eye in the Sky. It's got a lot in common with Eye in the Sky. I don't think this is nearly as suspenseful as that because Eye in the Sky, you're, in the, you're basically the... Uh, it was it Russell Crowe and uh, Chika Ikagwe, um, okay. Blade Sergeant Nia, uh, the two that are in the, uh, uh, you know, running the drones. Um, and I in the sky, they're pretty much in there the whole time looking at the the area they're searching on and, you know, giving intel on. Um, this one's not quite as uh, suspenseful as that, but I think it still works. And I think one thing that uh, this one does that eye in the sky doesn't is that you mentioned the comedic aspects of it but at the end of the day they're in a room basically i mean not to minimize it what they're doing but they're essentially playing a video game you know they're sitting in a chair doing the controllers they're not on the field like luke hemsworth characters so like when you have the scenes with uh or i'm sorry liam hemsworth when you have the scenes with liam hemsworth and like the the soldiers like you know taking fire and it's like all intense and then they cut back to the uh drone operators and someone pops their head in going hey i'm doing a starbucks run you guys want anything it's it's funny but also kind of illustrates the uh, inherent differences in what both teams are doing. Even though they're working together, they have completely different uh, contexts of what they're playing with. I really like the the action parts of this, the the parts on the ground, um, you know, all the, the war stuff uh, is really intense. Um, and then all the, uh, and actually all the stuff in the uh, uh, drone room can get intense uh, because, you know, that you, you get, uh, you know, uh, the characters in there are 
intent on saving their soldiers. Meanwhile, people outside of that room are just kind of doing random day to day things and kind of, you know, not taking things as seriously as they should. Uh, but kind of makes sense at the same time because they're not in it. So I I really like that dynamic of this. And yeah, this was a good one, I think. Well, Bruce? Um, I have a similar reaction too. I, I th- you know, we've said it many times, almost every episode that I'm not an action guy. So a lot of times these lower budget or less big, this is probably a fairly l- large budget, budget, but not compared to like, I don't know, a Top Gun or something. But um, a lot of the ones we get, I don't think the action is usually very good. Whereas I think the action here is is really well staged and there's a variety of types of action, which is kind of refreshing. You know, you've got the, you know, trying to be stealthy and stay out of sight of the, the you know, the bad guys in the jungle. You've got the, you know, trying to uh, achieve a mission and not get detected side of things. And then you've got another side of things in the third act. I'm not going to describe because that would give away like what goes down um, on the negative side. This has got the political, I guess, uh, complexity of a Top Gun movie. You know, the bad guys are foreign. They're bad. Uh, that's about almost all we see, except for people that they kill. And the Americans are good. And the drone operators are only hitting bad guys because there's no one else with bad guys around to hit unless it's a uh, friendly fire and they have to try to watch out for the good people and not hit them. That, I mean, it's it's that. Whereas Eye in the Sky, on the other hand, actually dealt with some of the really tricky, weird stuff that goes on with drone warfare, you know. But this is not that kind of movie. This is the kind of movie where you kind of, this is a, I could sit text to my dad who maybe is more of a blue state guy or a red state guy. And I'm more of a blue state guy. And we could both enjoy this movie together and not have to argue very much because the lines are very clearly drawn and it's not realism uh the action's pretty good the russell crowe stuff is kind of unintentionally funny sometimes because it's sort of so goofy but i really do enjoy the russell crowe we're getting these days where this is the pope's exorcist russell crowe this is the i'm just gonna put all the he's almost getting into nick cage territory where he's He's in movies that maybe sometimes are not asking him to do as much as he does. And what he does is sometimes bigger than it needs to be for the roles. But it's it's a lot of fun to watch, even if it tonally is a little bit odd sometimes. Um, I really enjoyed it. I, I think that uh, I'll hear what you say, Greg. I think you hinted at some possible eye rolling moments at the end. I mean, at that point, the outlandishness was here in this movie a little bit anyway. So I just rolled with it. Um, yeah, I had a good time with this movie. And there was Bruce. really not, oh. not too much. Yeah, Eric. Oh, I, I was going to uh, hop on a quick thing Bruce said about Russell Crowe. Would you call him Uncle Crowe? Because he's got kind of a avuncular <laughs> kind of uh, yeah. disposition in a lot of his newer movies. He kind of plays, um, oh, what was the character? The opposite. I can't, I remember in uh, Lethal Weapon movies, there's Riggs, but what's, what's. Danny Glover? Yeah, yeah, Danny Glover's character. What's his character? Is Oh, he, uh, I don't know. It's a Christmas movie. Yeah, anyway. Murtaugh. <laughs> he, he, Murtaugh, thank you. He kind of plays that in a little way. He's kind of like the, uh, I've had enough of this stuff. And oh, gosh, you know, and he's like, it's almost like he's not ready to retire, but he's almost like, you know what? I'm just, I'm just putting in the time now. Can we just make this <laughs> be done? But yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of fun to watch. Yeah, Land of Bad was actually crafted by William Eubank, the co writers, David Frigerio. And per Eric's interview, I learned that it was written and finished as a screenplay, or at least the idea or the execution of it, all the way back to his days of doing the sig- uh, whoops of doing the signal. Eric, did you ever get to finishing the signal? No, I no, I didn't. Okay, I yeah, I love the signal. So, yeah, it's interesting. So it's been circulating in his brain for about almost, I think, at least almost a decade. So I, I think it's a very strong story. My only mini complaint is Eric was mentioning about the stuff on the ground. The stuff on the ground is way better than the Russell Crowe subplot stuff. And that's fine because you're supposed to actually be frustrated with what's going on in that department. And Russell Crowe is 
great to watch. It's more of a, it's more of sort of the mechanic of that subplot is supposed to frustrate you because there are people there that are actually screwing up the mission by just watching a basketball game. There's some weird dynamic there. So actually the stuff on the ground, I think is intended to be a superior story to the Russell Crowe subplot. So overall, I didn't have a problem with it. It was just the obvious thing is the stuff that's action is the best part of Land of Bad. As far as the preposterous third act regarding the drone pilot and someone else, I'm not going to mention too much, but I, they should have ended it a little bit earlier. But again, it's a minor quibble. It's I'm not saying I didn't want it there. I'm sure there are people who would like to have it there, but I'm neither here nor there on it. I, I really stuff I really thought the action stuff was really well executed. I'm a big William Eubank fan. I definitely need to see underwater. I love again, like I said, I love the signal so much. Land of Bad only in theaters. February 16th, four stars from me. What about you, Eric? Final thoughts? I do kind of agree that the the some of the stuff in the, the drone room is kind of frustrating, but I also think it pays off at the end. There's a, there's a moment at the end where that doesn't pay off nearly as well if you're not frustrated with the stuff that Russell Crowe is dealing with. 100%. Um, and yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, uh, Eye in the Sky and Lone Survivor, you know, two good movies. You put them together, you got Land of Bad another good movie i would probably go three and a half four stars on this i think four stars four stars for eric holmes what about you bruce i think i'm three and a half i had a good time with it cool okay so that is land of bad again directed by william eubank but i want also want to mention uh, milo ventimiglia is very good as a leader of the delta force team when you think of him you think of what is that movie the art of racing in the rain gilmore girls and most recently this is us is that the name of the, the show and then he was also rocky balboa's son you don't really oh, think of him in this role I, that's the one i was gonna bring <laughs> that's the one you're yeah so he's very good in this movie and also his the brother chris hemsworth he's good as one one of the delta force team members as well just all around good movie three and a half from bruce four stars for me and eric next up in theaters and on digital friday february 6th, 16th is a movie called monolith it's a very easy title it's i mean it's a very easy plot i'm gonna actually sum it up in 20 seconds, a journalist, journalist, podcaster, played by Lily Sullivan. She's trying to do a podcast about a black brick. That's the story. She's in her house. She interviews some people. Things get weird. It's 95 minutes rated R. It's considered a sci-fi thriller. Even though there are different voices through interviews and people she talks to, it's essentially a one-person show that it's directed by Matt Vesley and written by Lucy Campbell. That's it. Monolith. If you like that, those kind of movies, slow burn thrillers with just one person like Locke might be for you. Might not be for you if you're expecting something more and you want things to really, this world to open up. It opens up in different sublime ways, but there's not going to be 40 people walking into that door to expand the narrative of Monolith. Bruce Berkey, start with you on your view and thoughts on the movie. Yeah, overall, I, I really like this movie. Um, I think that I wouldn't compare it as much to Locke as I would to uh, movies that are kind of like, you know how you have these screen movies where it all takes place on the screen, uh, like a computer screen? I think it's Missing, I mean, think might be one of those yeah, movies. Sure. If I, Not Sagasu, yeah. but the, the other. Missing. Yeah, but the other one. Um, I think it's like one of those where it's like, even though this is an audio version of that, right? The screen isn't going to be, you're not going to be seeing too much on the screen, but it's like one person and they're essentially uncovering an uh sort of an audio mystery slash conspiracy slash what we don't know what's going on and it kind of also goes into the kind of the territory of like coast to coast if you guys know coast to coast the radio yeah. show where it's every night it's about aliens or art, you know art bell george nori yeah ghost recordings or something like that and this is but this version she's doing a podcast which i think the podcast part is the weakest part of this because the podcast idea of this is that she's releasing these podcasts as kind of a series and slowly as she talks to different people who have encountered this brick, uncovering the mystery possibly or expanding the mystery of this brick through her podcast. But I think where it's weak to me is that it kind of imagines a world where there's immediate response to her podcasts like they were, you know, radio breaking news broadcasts. And I don't think in the real world that, that there isn't just that much response to that kind of stuff. I don't think maybe no, not, not maybe for us, 
maybe no. I mean, yeah, not for us, but I just, I just don't experience that world as being a thing so much. There's only been a couple podcasts I can think of that were super buzzy and super like really blew up in the, the consciousness of people, but it doesn't matter. It's, it's a, it's a plot device for this movie. I think what is strongest about this, um, definitely a number one is the performance of Lily Sullivan, you know, cause she carries 90% of this movie other than whoever the she's talking to. She's kind of interviewing and, you know, hunting down people that kind of unravel this mystery. Um, and I really love the tone of this movie. It has a really slow, creepy, um, kind of a dread to it, uh, which I think works. I think it works really quite well. And then, of course, the the other question is, does the mystery resolve in a way that's satisfying? And I think pretty much it does for me. Yeah, I think this is a pretty, once again, a pretty solid uh, indie thriller mystery horror sci-fi i'm not sure what it is in that category yeah do you think people who like podcast bruce will be predispo predisposed to actually almost kind of liking monolith it might be up their alley but you said the podcast portion was the weakest part of the narrative yeah which I, I don't think that's the audience for this i think the audience is this is people who like um args or you know online mysteries or these kind of um created rabbit hole sites i think that's conspiracy people like people that love to look into those kind of things i think that's the audience for this okay that's very very interesting your thoughts eric well first of all it's kind of weird that um has there been a movie that really captured the idea of a podcast because like even kevin smith's movies his later movies he's had people that uh uh tusk they're a podcast and kevin smith does podcasts like he's one of the pioneers of that he should know and you'll watch uh, the podcast in his movie. And it's like, that's, oh, you're off, dude. How, how, how do you get that far off? But yeah. Uh, regardless of that, um, yeah, Mon Monolith is, uh, I, I would say like the first, th this was uh, similar to uh, Unwelcome for me, where I didn't like most of the movie up until the end. And then it really got me. Um, mostly, I mean, beyond the, the podcast stuff, but. I thought this was going to be one of those uh, uh, conspiracy theories, you know, a conspiracy theorist like, oh, this, this and that. And look, there's a number three on a dollar bill, which means so if you add it to 14, the number 17, which means this or like, you know, I, I thought it was going to go there and then uh, not only go there with the conspiracy theory, but hey, look, conspiracy theorist is actually right. And I really don't like movies like that because. Look, conspiracy theorists have enough ammo. You don't need to give them more in your movie. But uh, I thought where the end of this went uh, kind of reined it all in a lot more. And uh, uh, without saying too much, uh, the the end is the part that really brought me back around. But up until like the third act, I was like, no, no, not liking this at all. But uh, it 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 uh, it I I think it finally. Uh, you know, finally earned everything and kind of paid off by then. So I'm glad I stuck with it. But that that first uh, two thirds was rough getting through. Got it. Yeah, it's slow burn. I think some people will not be on board. I was totally on board from the first second up to the ending. Loved the entire part of them. Just really enjoyed it. I thought it was a very solid experience. I love the podcasting part. And like Bruce, I thought that worked. I like the conspiracy stuff. So I was all on board. I like. I haven't seen Lily Sullivan in Evil Dead Rise. Definitely have to see her in that. Bruce was saying that she's the, what she's the best part of the movie. Maybe she's the one who anchors that narrative. That movie. Well, Lily Sullivan, I mean, Bruce, that yeah. movie has a lot of great parts to it. I think, and a lot of people did enjoy it. Some people hated it, but she definitely shines in that movie. Is very memorable. So put it that way. Okay. Yeah. This is a very. This is a tour de force performance from Lily Sullivan, in my opinion. Four stars from Monolith. What about you, Eric? Um, I'll probably go three stars on this. Uh, cause I like early on, I was like at one and a half, two stars. And then it finally, uh, finally bumped up by the end. So I'll go three stars on this. Cool. Bruce. Um, I will say four stars and I would just say if people are listening to us and are kind of confused on where they want to fall on this, I would say if you enjoy movies like Lake Mungo or Pontypool, I think those yeah. are two movies that are great, like tonal you know, kind of indicators for how this movie kind of goes. I haven't, yeah, seen, uh, I haven't seen Lake Mongo, but uh, Pontypool's a, a good shot on this. 
that's one of those things where you just have to get into that vibe. And if you're not, then it's going to be a little bit of a catch, catch as catch can experience. I think the one thing that we all agree upon is the ending of Monolith, which I think is pretty cool. Bruce, you liked it. Eric, you bumped up your rating just because of that. Well, do you guys want to know what happens in the end? Well, listen to our Cinematics Patreon because I actually asked them, asked the director, Matt Vesley, and Lily Sullivan about the end of Monolith, which can be interpreted in two different ways. Mm. What? You don't think it can be... Key, <laughs> could, are you, I, I, this? Are you I, on? I, I I think it's pretty clear which one it is, and in fact, I think really? there's a I think there's a third way it can be interpreted. Okay, fair, fair. Uh, two or three ways that it can be interpreted. If you're like Eric and you say it's going to be one specific way, there could there could be arguments back and forth. Why don't you listen to Lily's argument and Matt's argument regarding the end of Monolith? That will be exclusive to our Cinematics Patreon members this coming weekend when I put post. The that exclusive only Patreon video. So check that out for Monolith. Whether you love it or not, here's a good thing. You can purchase it on digital on Friday. If you don't like it, you can yell at me and Bruce. And if you're a Patreon member for a $5 catch-all, you can actually get some really cool stuff that the rest of the public will not get. Well, who knows? Maybe they'll get it. Maybe they'll actually talk about the ending in other outlets, but you're going to have to go, go digging. You have that source right here for our Cinematics Patreon. Now, our third and final featured is this movie called Lights Out. Eric was saying that he's trying to remember this movie from three weeks ago that we both saw it because we both interviewed separately the director, Christian Sesma, I believe. Yeah, Christian Sesma is the director of that. Sesma previously directed The Night Crew and Pay Dirt. The movie stars Frank Gil uh, Grillo. As I think, Eric, you like Frank Grillo. You're a Grillo fan. You like his stuff? Love Frank Grillo. In fact, I love the entire cast of this. Okay. Okay. We're going to get to that in a second. That's Michael Duffy Duffield. That's played by Frank Grillo. He is described here as a homeless veteran. I like to consider Duffy as a guy who's just sort of like Bruce Banner, Bill Bixby in The Incredible Hulk. He's so, just sort of a wanderer who just goes from town to town. He ends up meeting this former con named Max, played by Mackay Pfeiffer. Max sees Duffy handle himself pretty well at a bar. He had, there is an altercation, if I recall, over a card game, possibly. And Duffy does really well against some of the rougher tr rougher, rougher sort in that bar. So what happens is Max, that ex-con, he, he goes up to Duffy and said, hey, you want to make some money? There's some underground fighting stuff that I can get you in. And you and I can make some cash. Duffy is initially reluctant, but he joins the fray, makes some money in these underground fights, but it gets a little bit more complicated than that. Dermot Moroni, who is really good these days playing a bad guy, he is a crime boss who ends up in their sphere, and he you realize that Max may owe a debt to the Dermot Moroni character, so maybe Max's life and his family, I think his sister and niece, they, they might be in danger. Who knows? Duffy, and, and this is also, part parts of it are set in, I don't know, the beginning is set somewhere in a desert area, and most of it is set in Los Angeles. The rest of the movie has Duffy, who is, again, a nomad and a military vet, ends up ingratiating himself, initially reluctantly, into the lives of Max and his immediate family. It's sort it's weird. It's sort of a family drama, but then it's also a action thriller. Co-stars Jamie King as one of the bad people in the movie, and she's very good and convincing. So Jamie King, Mackay Pfeiffer, Frank Grillo, Dermot Moroni. Eric was mentioning he liked really enjoys all of these actors. And it was written by Chad Law. I don't know who Chad Law is, but people like me and Eric know who Chad Law is because Usually lately, when we see a movie, it has Chad Law as the writer. So this is the type of movie that we say, hey, Bruce, take your time. Go see something else. Recommend it towards the latter part of cinematics. You have your, your box movie. You have some really classy stuff you want to review. The stuff that maybe – I'm not saying Lights Out isn't classy. I'm just saying it might not be for Bruce. might not be for a certain ilk. 
this movie was right up my alley. I loved everything about Lights Out. I would watch it again. And oh, I think Eric should have yelled at me. It also stars one of his all-time favorite stars. And he's going to mention that in a, in like three, two, one. What did you think of Lights Out, Eric? Uh, yeah, Lights Out was good. Uh, it was really good. Uh, Scott Atkins was also. <laughs> There's a part Sorry. where, uh, well, Scott Atkins is like at the very beginning. And then you don't see him like through the entire movie. Which that sucked, you know, but you got Scott Atkins there just to have him in the movie. But I see why they didn't do it because kind of towards the end, they got to do the the last thing that they got to do. Um, well, because Frank Grill's uh, uh, Street Fighter pretty much and Mackay Pfeiffer basically becomes his manager. And so they, you know, but they get into some stuff and uh, they, uh, uh, let's see, Jamie King, she's, uh, uh, she's like basically a dirty cop and Dermot Mulroney. Which, by the way, Dermot, you mentioned Dermot Mulroney. I'm digging his uh, his uh, later career as well. He's turned into one of those WWE heels where he has like a total heel turn. He's turned into a complete a hole in several of his movies. The well, Dirty South, right? He's he's kind of similar to Eric Roberts, where like he'll be in movies like this, like he'll be in like you know uh, just uh, you know no budget movies, and then he'll show up in like a, a big budget. Like he he's kind of he kind of can step in both worlds i like him more in this world uh, what was that the dirty south who's in that south. uh yeah. blazing world the movie bruce loved as much as i did <laughs> I, I, I mean was bruce in, loved uh, the blazing world so cow? much i'm like dude cow? <laughs> um, what cow no what? no no oh, the, I, I night, the, night, the day after the night whatever that was that movie was who was in that the mm. day after, i'm talking about i don't he was in lights yeah. out he was in no, Lights Out in the Dirty South. and He's in a movie called Reckless, which we haven't seen yet, which I really want to see. I, I don't know if it's a Chad Law movie as well, written by Chad Law, but he is the head of Reckless, and it's a movie that you and I missed. Oh, so Chad Law wrote uh, The Flood and uh, right. uh, Till Death Do Us Part. That was another good one. Uh, yeah, both of them were. Although, although I think uh, they, uh, I think uh, uh, Mitch Burns reviewed uh, The Flood on, uh, on Hollywood Persona. Sorry. He didn't like that. <laughs> Again, that was one of his worst of the movie. But you know that. But regardless, we're, we're talking about this one right now. Oh, and, we have uh, to. Uh, can we also mention Amari Nolasco from Prison Break? Sorry, Bruce. Amari Nolasco, you might know. Some people might know him from Prison Break. He plays also this shady. What he's 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 a shady promoter, underground street fight promoter. So he has a little bit of time. Oh, was in he, one of, yeah. Was um, he the guy that was uh, okay? With the cane. I, I the cane. Yeah. I, I didn't recognize him from anything else, but yeah, he, was, yeah. he was really good in this. Bruce, well, I, I, I haven't seen Prison Break, so I wouldn't know. But You would love it, yeah. yeah. Bruce. Gone in the Night, a.k.a. Cow. <laughs> oh, all right. All right, yeah. That's, well, that was Cow the alternate title for Gone in the Night, right? Yes. <laughs> I love that. I love that movie. I, I thought you were talking just... about that boring ass movie where they're following a oh, cow for an no, hour. No, that was the other one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think I was the only one who really loved Gone in the Night. But anyways, Lights Out is Eric. You were saying about Scott Atkins. Oh yeah, Captain, yeah. So anyway, uh, you know, Scott Atkins shows at the beginning. You never see him throughout the whole thing. And then at one point, Frank Grillo and Mackay Pfeiffer and all them got to do the thing. They're like, uh, yeah, we. We're going to get our butts handed to us. And it's like, well, I know a guy. Next scene, as soon as he said, I know a guy, we hadn't seen Scott Atkins like all, except for the very beginning. We haven't seen him all movie. I'm like, <laughs> started getting all excited. Of course, Scott Atkins shows up and then they have like this really cool set action set piece towards the end where, you know, everyone fights and things happen and guns and everything goes off. This is, uh, I mean, Look, you know what kind of movie this is. You know, it's the kind of movie I love. And that's why I love I'm giving this, movie this too. That, that's is... why I'm giving this three star banger. This is a movie that me and Greg love. This is a movie Bruce is going to watch. And it's like, God, thank you guys for not making me watch this. So I think you, I think just listen to us. You know right away if this is yeah. a movie for you. If, if, you know, if you like those kind of movies, this is going to be like catnip for you. If you don't, you're just going to just, stay away whereas land of bad is like it's definitely the action kind of movie but i think non-action fans can still like it lights out is you're either in or out you know there's no there's no middle ground here look uh, look christian sesma there is a sequence where the frank grillo character he's getting 
involved with his family, right, in the yeah. LA home. And he sits out on the stoop, on the front stoop, with the sister of Mackay Pfeiffer's character. And that she's played by Erica Peoples. And they have a quick conversation about their past lives. It's just really well done. It's just a really well done dramatic sequence. And I mentioned that to Christian Sesma. This is not supposed to be a big time family drama, but there are splashes of some really interesting stuff in this movie. Eric, you mentioned Scott Atkins' part in the third act. That could be its own little movie. And I thought that was very cool. I And look, I am sort of... I, I, I'm not on that three-star... Unfortunately, I'm not on the three-star banger train that Bruce and Eric do. They are very... It, it's kind of good that I'm not in a way because... What Eric and Bruce, when they coined the three-star banger, they they want to talk about movies that are very good and they elevate the genre that they are representing. That is why Eric is giving this three stars. He calls it a three-star banger as opposed to a three-star film. I'm actually giving it the same rating that Eric is because uh, without the three-star banger side, I'm giving it four stars. It's And I probably am saying the same thing that Eric is. It's an elevated genre piece, in my opinion. I, I really had a good time at Lights Out. And Eric mentioned about the, the actors that he really enjoyed in this movie. All of them are good. I mean, they do a good job in this movie. So this is sometimes these movies that Eric and I like are sort of throwaway films that are. Eric was saying that he forgot about the movie several weeks ago. And I, during while we're talking about, it, he's actually recalling it. So that's probably means Lights Out is. Well, a good that, movie. that has more to do with the title. I was like, Lights Out. Did I see that? And I looked at the cast. I'm like, oh, I definitely saw that. <laughs> yeah. Jimmy but King is but to the, the point of Three Star Banger, Three Star Banger to me is like, for me, this would be like a four or five star movie. But most people wouldn't see it that way. Like only like certain yeah. people that are into this sort of thing would see it as a four or five star movie. People that aren't into that sort of thing would see it as a zero to one star movie. That That's what I mean by three star banger. Like if you're in for this, you're going to love it. If you're not in for this, you're going to hate it. Uh, like, um, shoot, uh, like, like, but like, like, like a lot of B horror movies, like, you know, there's certain horror movies that uh, horror movie fans just fall, like just absolutely love but they're not going to pull in new fans. You know, that there's like stuff like Psycho Gorman, which horror movie fans love, but it's also, um, it has crossover potential. So it could pull in new fans. So Psycho Gorman, not exactly three star banger. Whereas like, you know, I, I, I guess that's, that's where it is. Like, if you love it, you know, if you like this sort of thing, you're going to love it. If not, it's not going to, this isn't the one that's going to win you over. Yeah. This movie also looks good with whatever budget they were working with. Yeah, yeah, ninety oh. minutes, perfect film that Eric and I just basically we were. I think we were both in the bag with this with Lights Out, and both of us have interviews. I'll put it on our respective YouTube channels. Eric's interview with Christian Sesma and my interview as well. I, I've got. To, I'm so behind <laughs> uploading interviews. I'll, I'll put Eric's up first, and then I'll put mine up. But, anyways, three star banger for Eric and four stars for me. Any final thoughts on? Lights out, Eric, before we move on. Uh -oh. Yeah, the my only big problem with it is Scott Atkins should have been in it more. But, you know, can't have everything. And the fact that they had him in it at all, thumbs up. And that also more Dermot Moroni doing whatever he's been doing the last couple of years because I've been loving him. <laughs> he's so good in this And look, I, I'm not giving too much away. When you realize... There are several levels of bad people in this movie. And I love when there are several levels where it's sort of a bureaucratic evil where mm -hmm. the slime comes from the tops of the top all the way down to the bottom. And it's sort of a layered story like that. I, I really like Lights Out. Yeah, I, I should point that out because that's usually a bone of contention for some people. Uh, there are no good, uh, <laughs> morally good <laughs> characters. In it. Every character in this movie is bad in one one way or another. Granted. Frank Grillo's the Frank Grillo's the protagonist, but like even he's not, you know, if you're the kind of person that's like, I didn't like any of the characters, like they were all reprehensible. This is not your movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's Lights Out. My gosh, we spent so much time on on Lights Out, Bruce. This is one of the, those rare movies where I think, even though I was telling you not to see Lights Out, it would have been interesting. I think you might have three star banged this as well. <laughs> Anyways, hated it. 
Oh, you think he would have hated it? Wow. I know he would have hated it. Oh, that is awesome. That is awesome. We will never find out, Bruce, because we're never going to throw <laughs> lights out at you. Don't don't worry about that. Now, let's Pop get to a record. Hulu or something. Maybe I'll watch it. You never know. Yeah, I know. It's, it's elevated stuff. So we're done with our features. Let's get into our recommends, which is going to, of course, be anchored by Bruce and Eric. Bruce, you've been... Chilling with a Mai Tai for the last five minutes. Can you tell us what you recently saw, what you recommend? There's a movie that Eric reviewed about maybe even four or five months ago that you are slowly catching up on. What is it about? I mean, what do you think of it? Yeah, um, he, I think, watched this back in, I want to say August. So The Last Voyage of the Demeter, which came out, kind of came and went kind of quietly. And I remember, if I remember correctly, Eric thought it was pretty cool. Um, and I think this just got a lot of lackluster reviews. Like people, a lot of people were kind of disappointed by this movie. Uh, for anyone who didn't remember what this movie is, it's basically, it's taking this one chapter from the original Dracula, uh, which is basically the voyage of the Demeter, which is the ship bringing Dracula's coffin from his homeland to London. And it's, it's, there's a, I think that chapter, if, Correct me if I'm wrong, Eric, but that chapter is basically a captain's log. And yeah, I, I believe it was chapter 13. Yeah, Could be wrong about that, but it's only like 10 pages, something like that. Yeah, it, it's, it's very short. It's a captain's log, and it really just, it, the, the movie is like, let's take the little, the bones, the skeleton that's in that chapter and flesh it out and imagine what that voyage looked like, that doomed voyage. Uh, because essentially, at the beginning of the movie and in the book, it's essentially a ghost ship when it arrives, everyone's dead. And, you know, all they know is whatever they can t- take from the, you know, log captain's log. What I really love about this movie is I think this is a really rare kind of movie. It's not made much these days. And that is kind of a true Gothic horror, you know, just full of atmosphere, dripping with atmosphere, uh period piece, this great, creepy wooden ship. Um oh, you- great character design for the um for the dracula character in here and he's somewhere between a a bat creature and nosferatu and some kind of it's, it's really really well done and he actually kind of um i would say kind of transforms throughout the movie as he as he becomes stronger i guess you'd say um and it was more uh violent and gory than i thought it was actually had quite a bit of it was pretty bold on how it attacked certain characters and, and, and the, the, the fates of certain characters and, and probably complain about this movie because it's about two hours long, but I, I give it credit for that because it really took the time to create a world and to let you really care about the characters, which is a trick in a movie like this, right? It's kind of like the Titanic or something, right? You have a movie where you basically know that all these characters are going to die. And Bruce, that's a fact, spoiler. That's a yeah. That's like, and then there were <laughs> oh, none. What are you saying, Bruce? No, I might be lying. You never know. But all <laughs> no, these characters no, they, are uh, die. They, they they project that pretty yeah pretty well. <laughs> so to do that, to do that, and then to make you care about the characters, and then to make you hope that the characters are gonna make it out. That's a really good trick. And I feel like this is one of those movies you could watch over and over again and still worry for the characters. And to to make you worry for characters when you know the fate is really good. And I think this is pretty excellent filmmaking. It's oh, I didn't mention the, the director. The director is Andre Overdahl, who also directed a couple other great genre films, Troll Hunter and The Autopsy of Jane Doe. Both are super quality genre flicks, and um, I, I loved it. I thought it was great. Bruce, Thank obviously you. both. Of, oh, go ahead, Eric. Oh, it's, I think. Uh, I mean, granted, a bunch of people were supposed to do this and kept getting. Uh, apparently, he's supposed to be doing the long walk next. I don't know if that's uh, a thing. Not the Matty Doe long walk. <laughs> now, now, now we went like Stephen King, right? The Stephen King long walk. Yeah, but uh, I, I've heard that he was supposed to be doing that next, and uh, yeah, it, he. I, this is a great movie. I think one of the uh, when this came out, I think this got a bunch of bad reviews. So a bunch of people didn't see it. And I think what's happening now is people are kind of starting to go back at it, thinking, not expecting much, and then coming out going, wait, why did everyone hate that? This one, this is freaking rad. Eric, but, did you see yeah. this in the theater? You thought you saw it in the theaters, right? Yeah, I saw it when it came out. How did it look when 
just i mean i mean it's the gothic horror so it's dark but it, it looked cool and the yeah the vampire uh, dracula looks rad uh De, uh uh De Smolchian, david desmalchian's in it he's awesome like it, it was just a good movie and like i can't remember what star rating i gave it It had to have been like four and a half five maybe in 6.9 I, I really love this movie and i was kind of walked out a bit confused because i heard some bad reviews i'm like what movie was everyone watching because it wasn't this one well i remember that eric and so you felt maybe this is sort of a underrated gem can i say it's an underrated gem from both you guys is this one of these movies that frustrates you that more people don't watch this movie i guess I, yeah i would say so yes for sure i mean to me this is a perfect example of this is a pretty big budget movie from the look of it you can tell and i would say this is probably on the same scale budget wise and production wise of all these like conjuring movies and stuff right and for me i would and i said this i think on quick comment online um I would way, way rather watch a bunch of movies of kind of this sort than a bunch of Conjuring movies because I feel like, like I said, this kind of movie's lost. Like Hammer. This is almost like bringing back that kind of style, but with a little more oomph to it, I guess. Okay. And so I guess now are you going to go on an Andre Overdahl, Overdahl sort of deep dive? Because you mentioned two of his other movies, The Autopsy of Jane Doe and Troll Hunter. He has a whole bunch of other movies. Maybe... Even if they don't work out, maybe they might be interesting movies as well. You've liked all three maybe. of the movies you've seen. Yeah, and I think the one, the commonality I would say, because there are different kinds of movies, the commonality I would say is he really can create atmosphere. Of, and all three of those movies have great atmosphere, even though they're different tones. Uh, and I say Autopsy of Jane Doe, for anyone who's never seen the Autopsy of Jane Doe, that is a great, great contained horror movie with just like three characters pretty much and one of the characters is a corpse <laughs> so yeah it's awesome have you seen that eric the autopsy of jane doe no i don't think is that the that's not the that's not the uh brian cox courtroom drama it? one is it or no, that no it's... that's the exorcism of emily no emily wrote... I, I have not seen the autopsy of jane doe that's yeah it's brian huge. cox and um what's his name not emile hirsch right yeah um, emile hirsch oh nice wow, emile hirsch. brian cox emile hirsch and i think if i remember correctly his father and son they get this Jane Doe, and as they start doing the autopsy, really weird things start to be uncovered, literally within the corpse. So, I'd, uh, Andre cool. Overdahl, his next movie is Scary Stories They Tell in the Dark 2, not, yeah. not, the, not the long walk. So No, you it, could still be right because it could be like a long development process. That it's It probably... could be, but I, I just want to make sure I didn't misspeak. Okay, sounds good. Now... Let's see if Eric Holmes will speak for the couple of movies he wants to recommend. Okay. It's your turn for the recommends, Eric. Uh, I will start off with The Hobby. Uh, I think this one is uh, of the two. Well, both these movies are fun, but they're fun in different ways. The Hobby is uh, basically a documentary about card collecting, uh, baseball cards, garbage pail kid cards, uh, Pokemon cards are a big part of it. And I did a uh, interview with the director, Morgan John Fox and, um, in that interview, I told him, uh, that after I was done with this, it just kind of went down a YouTube rabbit hole. Um, this movie is, or this documentary is like, uh, you ever see a documentary and it gives you like a bunch of stuff, but it doesn't feel like it gives you everything, but it makes you want to learn more about it. There's only so much they can tell in a, a, the amount of time they have. And it's pretty dense. It's interesting enough that it got me to, uh, when I go look up more about the hobby, probably not. You know, I used to collect like, uh, you know, garbage pail kids and baseball cards and football cards and stuff back in the day. Uh, that didn't really stick. I don't know that I want to get back into it because <laughs> it gets expensive really quick. All the all the behind the scenes stuff, especially the stuff with the people that make the cards. Like there's a bunch of stuff of, about that that's uh, really fascinating. Um, I would say this is kind of one of those documentaries that if you're into... Uh, card collecting you're probably it's probably gonna tell you a bunch of stuff you probably already know or uh, if maybe. you weren't into it maybe as a child right it might still be of interest oh yeah yeah because it, it's changed a lot since uh since i was collecting cards um but also i think if you're not into it this is one of those documentaries that'll still pique your interest because I, I i think a lot of this stuff is really interesting so much so that you know i went to youtube right after it and had to learn more i would probably give this uh 
four and a half star and not wow. as high as I was quite expecting. I, I you know, I, I was like card collecting. Who cares? Okay, I'll watch it. And then as I'm watching, I'm like, ooh, and then what? <laughs> ooh, what, <laughs> what what are they gonna get when they open that pack of cards? You know, that that sort of thing. Um, so it, it's really fun in that aspect. And uh they keep cutting to a TV with like a, a there's like a pile of cards on top of the TV. And one of the pile of cards is like a box of gremlins cards. So that that's probably where the point five comes from. <laughs> the point five bump. Uh, did, second movie. Oh, really? Did, did, they, they, did they happen to mention by chance uh, Mars Attacks cards? No, but I mean, there's so many different ones. It wouldn't surprise me if that like flashed through and I just missed it. Okay. They have like so many because they call them. They call them. Uh, they split them up into sports cards and non sports cards. So, yeah. Eric, um, you mentioned the hobby. You were just talking about the hobby. It's available yeah. on TVOD. Oh, yeah. Starting February 16th on Friday. TVOD on February 16th. You gave it four and a half stars. Directed by Morgan John Fox. We'll have that interview up later this week. Eric's interview up on our Cinematics YouTube channel. 89 minutes. And you said the four and a half stars, four and a half rating. That means that you were really locked in from the get-go it, it was just oh yeah that four and a half it just kept you intrigued yeah I guess, yeah it was kind of like uh oh well, we we talked about that uh garbage pail kids yeah uh, documentary one. uh like a month or two ago I, and you know you think going in like garbage pail kids like okay cool i remember those but like how are you gonna do a whole documentary and then you start watching and go oh okay and not only that but there's more to learn from it so you know we can start uh but i think even more so with the hobby just because like the, the garbage pail kid story is the story and there's more that you can find out about it. But with the hobby, like they're just barely scratching the surface. And the fact that they have so much in that documentary, that's, I mean, that's kind of a testament to like how much story there, like this could have been a TV series, I think. Okay, cool. Eric, your next movie. And fortunately I, I had a screener link for it last week. I didn't get to it. I am so glad you got to it. I have no idea your thoughts on this movie. All I know is it stars Anthony Michael Hall. I saw the trailer and I don't know. Th tell us about this movie. All right. This one's Air Force One Down, uh, directed by James Banford, written by Stephen Paul, starring Catherine um, McNamara. Is that how you say that? Yes. Yeah. All mm -hmm. right. Um, Catherine McNamara is freaking awesome in this. Uh <laughs> That they so basically what it is it's uh was an executive decision with Kurt Russell when they're in the, oh, the I love that movie yeah the, the plane and then there's terrorists on the plane there's Halle uh, Berry there's Steven Seagal for what sixteen minutes or yeah. seventeen minutes hey, so you it, see that it, Bruce executive decision I've seen it okay thank God I was gonna I was gonna yell at you if you hadn't seen executive <laughs> freaking decision that movie's awesome anyways go ahead Eric. Uh, this is kind of similar to that. So, uh, uh, Catherine McNamara, uh, she plays Agent Allison Miles. Um, Anthony Michael Hall basically gives her, uh, basically hires her to be part of the Secret Service, I guess. And uh, and so she's on Air Force One with the uh, President, um, President Edwards, you know, <laughs> just random white guy president. You know, this is, this is not... Bruce uh, mentioned earlier with the uh, uh, um, oh Jesus, I, we literally just talked what about movie? It for, the Land what, of Bad. Land Bruce of Bad, was yeah. talking about with Land of Bad how it's uh, kind of uh, politically inert. I guess this one's kind of the same thing. Oh well, I wouldn't say it's politically inert because this is definitely a jingoistic sort of movie. Okay. Um. So if that's kind of if you're turned off by that, this is not going to be your thing. But I don't really. The, the, this is just kind of a setting for an action movie, so I don't really take the the uh, jingoistic part that seriously. I kind of like similar to watching Top Gun. Like I'm just watching Tom Cruise fly the planes. Like I'm not I'm not looking at this as a <laughs> giant political statement. Uh, similar with Air Force One down, but anyway. So uh, Catherine McNamara gets on Air Force One, and there's uh, terrorists on the plane. Or uh, more accurately, uh, is Gary kid, Oldman and Harrison kidnappers. Ford also on the plane? <laughs> they <laughs> they're, they're in coach. <laughs> they, they, they don't show up in this. Wolfgang Peterson, did he show up too? 
no. But uh, right. so she's so she's on the she's on the plane, and I, I think less terrorists, more kidnappers, because what they want is they want to get the president to go on the air and say something like, "I don't condone this," or "I condone." I, I couldn't even remember. It's just plot to hang an action movie on. Uh, but um, what is awesome in this is when they get to the fight, because Catherine McNamara, like while all that's going down, her and Anthony Michael Hall's kind of in a different part of the plane, uh, probably where Kurt Russell and uh, Wolfgang Peterson's hiding out at. <laughs> and so the, you know, the, uh, the kidnappers don't really know they're there. And so all that stuff's going down. So Catherine is like sneaking around. Um, uh, Anthony Michael Hall gets kind of, you know, whatever. But anyway, so they have a bunch of action scenes and they got like one or action scenes. Oh, and this, cool. And so when I was when I was um uh, interviewing the director, that's kind of what that's kind of what led me to the the question of the Scott Atkins versus Liam Neeson because Catherine McNamara brings it with the with the action movies. Like they don't do the Liam Neeson cut every punch because she can't handle it. Like that camera's on her the entire time and just watching her go through these action scenes and these wonders is something to behold. I think Eric, uh, did you just come up with a new term called what is it? The Liam Neeson cut? <laughs> it's like the quick cuts away from him. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Uh, well, maybe I started something, but uh, <laughs> no, the, the, so this is like, um, I think for a lot of people, this, like the stories, you know, whatever, the reason to go to this is the action stuff because the action, the the one or action scenes are really great. Uh, Catherine McNamara can hold her own. I'm a new fan of hers, and uh, okay. yeah, th- this is incredibly fun to watch. And yeah, check it out. And I think Ka- you would. Okay, Catherine McNamara and Scott Atkins. One more shoddy shot. What do you <laughs> think? <laughs> Say that again, but slower. <laughs> Okay, Air Force One down. I was making a bunch of jokes, but I think Eric has sold me on this movie. What is your rating on Air Force One down? Uh, this is another three star. Ba- I actually, I, I'll, you know what? I'll go four stars on this because I talked about like the three star banger, like the the people that are in for it are in for it, but the people that aren't, it's not going to bring them in. I think that Catherine McNamara's like her action scenes are so good. I think that even if you're not into like you might not like the movie. But when it gets to those action scenes, I think there are some people that are going to be pretty damn impressed by what they see. You have sold me. I am going to watch this movie. I don't even, I bet you my link is expired. I will purchase it on digital and I'll, I'll oh, report back on, on a rewind next week. Yes, sir. It is uh, available now on um, streaming and it is playing in select theater. Well, as of the ninth, it's playing in theaters. I don't imagine a movie like this stays in theaters very long. But if you can find this in a theater, definitely go to the theater and watch it. And it's available on digital. I was the idiot who did not see it last week. My link is expired. I will fork over some money to see it. And I will make sure get, Bruce gets a digital code gift from Greg's Rizapasi. Let's see if he <laughs> sees it. Just kidding, I Bruce. Would just, I would just say, looking at the poster, if nothing else, I think that... Um, any young Republican couple can definitely use that as their next Christmas card. Just, just have to like recreate <laughs> that and it'll be perfect. Just send that out. That's very, very good, Bruce. You know, one of these days we just want Bruce, we're going to put Bruce on the John Millius train where he just watches all these type of movies for the next, I don't know, Eon. That'd be great. But um, I'm so glad that this is a pretty well-rounded episode, which is so many different kind of movies. I'm actually glad that the Eric Holmes, Greg Srizavosti, straight to DVD, straight to digital sort of kind of thing. I, I like to elevate that. And one of these days we're going to get Bruce to actually become passionate and fall in love with that genre we'll see if that works out down the road that is a hobby four and a half for eric and again four stars for air force one down those are two great recommendations bruce has another great recommendation four and a half stars for the last voyage of the demeter i don't know if i pronounced that correct correctly box movie is coming up but anyways let's get to our I was going to say sponsor I, because I don't know. I, Pete doesn't drop that beat anymore. We, we, he drops the ad. Eric Bruce, is there any a segue that you can say to, before this MCFC a- advertisement? Eric Bruce? Yo, 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 Pete, drop that sponsorship. Wait. 
Hey there, classmates. Tune in to Middle Class Film Class every Monday and Wednesday for weekly movie news, streaming picks, and one deep dive review. The Batman trailer. There was a teaser. There was a trailer. Trailer one, trailer two. Final trailer? I don't know if it's the same one. How many trailers do we need exactly? Leave an email or a voicemail to join in the discussion. Bullshit artist! Uh, <laughs> yeah, buddy. All That's right. awesome. You're going full Danzig. That's right, I am. My, my trans you have no power over me. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Love it. No, I love it. Love it. All right. We are back. Let's just say Pete a bit. Of, he does sponsor. You know, Pete actually messaged me the other day because I was actually, he actually had a review of Land of Bad on Tuesday. Our publicist told us the Land of Bad review should be on Wednesday. So I cl- I tried to clarify that and warn Pete to not drop that beat slash review on a Tuesday. Pete in all his wisdom, corrected me because our buddy Jack Fitzpatrick from the YouTube channel. What, Eric? What's the YouTube channel? Let's Crash This Parade. Yeah, it's from Let's Crash This Parade. He edited that Land of Bad review. That looked great, too. Okay. I haven't, I've seen yeah. parts of it, and Pete and Tyler, Noe, and Joseph Navarre, they're doing a great job over at Middle Class Film Class with their podcast, weekly podcast, and their YouTube channel. But the Land of Bad review, Pete ended up being right because it was edited in Australia. They were, I believe, a day ahead. So technically, it's pretty much a Wednesday embargo. And Pete was able to clear it up with our publicist who told us to not wait till Wednesday. So I'm glad everything got cleared up. I think Pete, go check out Pete Abeda's review of Land of Bad. In fact, I'll link it up uh, in the show notes. To jump on that a little bit, that video did look fantastic. Uh, I don't know if uh, Jet Fitzpatrick uh, wants to be hired as an editor. But I'm sure you might not say no. So if you're making a movie and you need an editor, hit up uh, Jack Fitzpatrick because he did a fantastic job on the video. Okay. Well, that will be two links. That will be Peter Beta's link for Land of Bad, edited by Jack Fitzpatrick. And we will put a link for Jack Fitzpatrick's Let's Crash This Parade as well if you want to contact him for editing duties or just watch the channel. Jack yep. is a very good uh, YouTuber. Very, very uh, well-spoken. Be- way better spoken than me also better spoken than me is bruce perky who has his box movie (laughs) back Uh, yeah you are back what is your box movie uh this one was suggested by mitch burns thank you mitch burns uh it's the stanford prison experiment which i only knew vaguely of as a a reality but not too much detail on i don't know if either of you seen this movie so if you have obviously chime in i think okay look before we chime in i think eric if i recall liked this movie it has an Mm all-star cast and here's the thing i'm an idiot because the stanford prison experiment about a year and a half ago on dollar tree they had like scores of the stanford prison experiment available for a dollar i would buy them and i would give them away for our cinematics facebook group and i looked around i don't have any more of these copies so (laughs) i bet I gave away, and I don't mind giving it away to our Cinematics Facebook group members. I check out, just join our group member thing. It's really cool. Join Cinematics Facebook group. But this seems like one of those movies. We went back to the, what, the voyage, the last voyage of the Demeter. This movie, The Stanford Prison Experiment, the lay person like me, who doesn't, is not very well versed in this genre, probably hasn't seen it. But a lot of people have talked about how good this movie is. So, Bruce, go for it. Yeah, so directed by uh, Kyle Patrick Alvarez uh, from 2015. Uh, and as you mentioned, I'm not going to mention everyone who's in this, but it's pretty star-studded cast, at least now. I mean, some of those people were a little newer at the time, but you got Ezra Miller in here as 8612, because they get numbers eventually instead of names. Um, Ty Sheridan, Billy Crudup, Olivia Thurby, and a lot of other people. Uh, basic concept of this is it's based on a real event that took place in 1971 where this uh, Stanford, you know, Stanford professor, I think, I don't remember what he was actually, what his sociology or something like that. And um, they decided to put this experiment together. And I think if I remember correctly, it was during the off season. So they had a building available to them and they essentially take a hallway and they turn it into a de facto prison where the hallway, all the rooms, they make like little, they put new doors on them that have like uh, bars and uh, they essentially put a, you know, 
call out, casting call essentially for students saying, we're going to do this experiment. If you want to be part of this experiment, you'll get paid this many dollars per day um, for doing this for two weeks. And essentially what they do is they, they pick all the people that are going to be in the experiment, uh, all males, and then they randomly divide them into guards and prisoners. And they tell them the rules. They say, you know, these are going to be your basic rules. After that, we're going to just watch you. You're going to be here for two weeks. And what happens, happens. But you got to follow the rules. And the main rule is that there's a bunch of rules, but the main one is that the guards can't, you know, physically hurt you or touch you or anything like that. But everything else is pretty much open for that fair game. And uh, so essentially, that is almost the beginning of the movie. It doesn't really have a whole lot of prologue. It really just sets up the situation, lets you meet the main characters, tell you what the situation is going to be, and lets it go. And quite fascinating. And from all accounts, this is pretty true to the events that actually occurred. And it's, you know, a lot of people can read like Lord of the Flies or just like how people become inhumane to other people immediately, how power structures immediately take place. I think that the most shocking, or I won't say shocking, but the most surprising thing to me was how quickly it goes sideways because when you're watching things just go awry you're like oh this must have been like three or four days and then the thing flashes on the screen day one <laughs> and you're like wait what <laughs> that was day one <laughs> so and that's that's a pretty good indication of kind of how this goes and just the way that some of the guards and some of the quote prisoners really start to love their roles um and in scary ways it's, it's quite a good movie i i'm not going to go into too much detail i think just if it sounds interesting to you you should go watch this uh it is definitely um kind of a little lost gem uh great acting very interesting story and um will open some eyes if you have never heard of it okay what is your rating on the Stanford prison experiment just uh one stars one star uh one star <laughs> no i say four stars for me um the only thing i think going against it is that you know, going with reality, uh, there is a little bit of a repetitiveness to, repetitiveness to it because at a point you're like, dang, it's just bad and staying bad. And I, I kind of want it to stop. I mean, that's the point. <laughs> but they also don't sugarcoat it and try to give it kind of a, a beautiful arc. You know, they let happen pretty much happen. So that's not know? actually... It's more of you being uncomfortable, but they're supposed that you're supposed to be uncomfortable and they're doing their yeah, job. Yeah, in, in the sense of like you want, sometimes you want that narrative structure, you know, because it's more satisfying, but this doesn't have that. And that's not really its detriment. It's just that it doesn't give this much satisfaction. But I mean, as far as a movie goes, it's, uh, there's, I really know gripes with it. I, I enjoyed it overall quite a bit. So if you said this already, I apologize, Bruce. How did you see this movie? You just, um, would you pay for it? Did you see it um, on streaming? What was it on? Where is it on streaming? This was... Where did I see this? Now I can't even remember. Oh, okay. oh it was a free... Uh, Tubi? It was, it was on one of the... Tubi, yeah. It was on Tubi. It was, I was going to okay. say, I know it was on one of the streamers. Yeah. Lately, it's weird because I don't know if, Eric, if you gone through this or Bruce, you go through this, how you watch your movies. I don't know how you guys do it. I think if you guys have an iPad, I have an iPad where I have several streaming options. I go to Hulu, I go to Disney Plus, I go to Max, and I look around, and I just see a glut on Peacock. No disrespect to these channels, these streaming services. I spend 20, 25 minutes looking for a movie. Still can't find them. Still can't find the movie I want. It's a waste. There's a glut of stuff, but I still can't find... It's hard to find a movie. Do you guys ever feel that way when you're going through things to watch with your streaming but, services or never not really because the stuff i need to watch is usually for the show so. <laughs> yeah you're you're, you're you doing your me. job <laughs> yeah you're doing you're doing your job eric but but yeah every once in a while like like i'll watch a um uh like for instance i want to watch the uh incredible shrinking man and uh you know, you just uh, basically what I would do is I just go type in incredible shrinking man streaming because I got my computer uh, HDMI to the TV. Oh, very cool. So I'll just I'll just look for it there and then I'll find it. And if I do, cool. If not, I'll find other means. Other oh. means. OK, very cool. So I like the way you look at it. You do it in a more sort of a renegade kind of way as opposed to what most lemmings like me do, where we have just a bunch of apps 
where I never watch any of these movies and I spend a couple hundred dollars like an idiot every month on these streaming services. What about you, Bruce? We have a lot of streaming services and I would say it's kind of 70, Easy to find? 70, 30, like sometimes Okay. it's easy, but sometimes classic movies are, are tough to find. Um, Or a but movie you want. Do you ever scroll unnecessarily? Oh yeah, it, it happens. It happens. There'll be movies I want to see and it's just not, not available out there. That definitely happens, but there's so many other movies that I need to see that I haven't seen that I can almost always go to another option. And that is a great op that is, I, I agree with you, but then there's sometimes there are movies that are just taken away from us. Then you go buy it. Yeah. And then you, oh, well, then you go buy it. But then sometimes on physical, I don't know about physical media or, or like you said, you buy, you can buy it, in a, not physical media. You might have to buy it on digital. The reason Maybe. why I was asking these questions is you mentioned Kyle Patrick Alvarez, the director of the Stanford prison experiment, 2023, as of last year, he directed this movie called Crater for Disney plus stars, Isaiah Russell Bailey, McKenna Grace. I love I love me some McKenna Grace. I, I, she's a great actress. Love her stuff. Got some pretty good reviews. It was on Disney Plus for a month and they pulled it. How do you pull a Disney movie? No disrespect, Disney Plus. I love you, please. If you want to sponsor our show, you're cool. I'm, I'm not being brave here. But but I, the idea of you have a movie that you finance that is under the Disney Plus umbrella that after a month, It's taken out. What is that? Oh, something wicked this way comes. Uh, Eric's going to Same mention thing. that, right? <laughs> oh, oh, very, very good, Eric. So Ray Bradbury, something wicked this way comes. I think it's 1983 or 84, stars Jason Robards. I think Eric Holmes reviewed it years back, either on Movie Mainline or Find Your Film. And Eric, you were going to say that it was on Disney Plus for a little bit and then Uh, it just pulled? no. So they had it on DVD, which is what I got there, but it, it's damn near impossible to find now. Now, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking it up now because I'm sure as soon as I say it out loud, come to find out that it's streaming on something. But uh, for the longest time, that movie was very difficult. to And like, I remember watching it on TV. I think it was a Disney channel back in the day. And I loved it. And I was looking for it. I couldn't find it anywhere. I just happened to come across that DVD at one point. I bet you that DVD is probably worth something. Bruce and I remember something Wicked This Way comes because we are Gen Xers. So I think, Bruce, either you saw it in theaters or it was available. The thing with Crater, though, is I don't know if it's in physical media as of yet. It was released a year ago. The way you can buy Crater is purchasing, renting, purchasing the movie on digital, which is fine. But the idea that a Disney Plus movie decides you're a Disney movie, we're just going to take you off our service. That's I, I just don't know the business side of it. But again, that was directed by Kyle Patrick Alvarez. If you want to check out the Stanford Prison Experiment, maybe dig dig some more and maybe you might see his movie Crater. I definitely want to, just on the principle of it, I might want, just want to spend some money and check out Crater, see if it's any good. So that is it. Bruce, you have a pick for next week for our box pick, box movies. For the week after, I believe, because next week we're doing, uh, I think we're doing our Patreon, right? Are, are we doing our Patreon? Oh, yeah, yeah. Did I say? Is it next you know, week or the week after? I think I said, look, folks, I think it's, um, do you want to, earlier in the month I said, hey, uh, we're not going to do this again. I think I got to look up our Google calendar is two Wednesdays from now, the last day in February. Uh, let me look I think it you're up. you're right, right, actually. I think it is. I don't it even is, know what so, day it is now. I think we're okay. Okay, we're so okay. So next week, so, okay, next week's yeah. box movie is. Da, 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 da. Dressed, suggested by Mark Pellington. Yay, Mark Pellington. Oh, Remember, you got him yes. on. Yes. Great, great interview. Uh, great, great Prince interview. and the uh, Prince of the City. Is that the Sydney Lament? I do believe. Okay. So, our last day of Patreon will be February 28th. The actual last day of the month is February 29th on Thursday. So, we will be doing Patreon for two weeks. Actually, Bruce was right. Earlier in the month, I said to everybody, we are not going to do Patreon on the last day of the month. Oh, well, I, so well, I, we I thought we were going to do get it. Get over yourself. Yeah, I, I should get over myself. Unfortunately, we are. We're going to do it a day earlier, the day before the last day. Okay. So again, if that's the untold story, Patreon members, tell us what is the second movie you want to pick. The Sydney Lumet film, Prince of the City. Wow. I'm sure that's available to rent or purchase. And I can't. I'm going to join you on that one, Bruce, and you better join as well, Eric Holmes, yeah. Prince of the I City. I haven't seen that for probably 40 years, 30 years, however long it's been out. Oh, so you kind of remember the movie, right? 
I remember the basic concept of it. Yeah. Yeah, Prince of the City was actually supposed to be directed by Brian De Palma and I think starring possibly John Travolta could have been. But it ended up being Treat Williams, right? Treat Williams Treat. again. Yeah, Treat Williams and then Sidney Lumet. Yeah, I asked. So, um, Treat Williams, rest in peace. During one of these TV movie junkets, I actually, I actually asked. There was a radio roundtable. I asked Treat Williams about working with Lumet on Prince of the City. I love that movie so much. I can't wait till you guys get to it. Final thoughts, Eric Holmes, before we get out of here? A couple things. One, I believe next week we'll cover She is Conan, a new movie by Bertrand Mandico, who did uh, The Wild Boys and After Blue. And I'm not done with She is Conan yet. Uh, about a little more than halfway through. And it's just as crazy as Wild Boys and After Blue. Yes. So uh, look, look forward to that. I'll, I'll uh, ne Next week, I'll get uh, more uh, information on when its release is, because I think it's kind of doing like a very slow kind of trickle release, which is unfortunate. But, you know, uh, Bertrand Mandico's great uh, new filmmaker, I guess, air quotes. I don't know how new or old it, they are, but, you know, the movies are uh, pretty insane and awesome. And the other thing I wanted to bring up is uh, if you want to know what our top 10 movies of the 2023 is, uh, maybe go check out the Force 5 podcast because that episode, well, first half of the episode is up. The Our top 10s is up. But I guess next week they're going to do the ancillary uh, part. So it's split into two episodes. So go check that out. Yes, very great podcast, Jason Kleberg from Jason Kleberg. And we were honored, we continue to be honored to be guests of Jason Kleberg's Force 5 Universe. Final thoughts, Bruce Berkey. Um, well, as I was listening to you guys talk about Lights Out and uh, all those kind of movies, I thought I need a term for those kind of movies. And all I could come up with was floating head splody movies because usually the posters have a lot of floating heads and explosions. So floating yeah. head splody movies. <laughs> there you go wow we're, we're, we're gonna make you love us one of these days bruce perky anyways here's claire goodbye everybody thank you for joining cinematics